Welcome to Lesson 7C, Building Block Complex Potentials. In this lesson, we'll define what I call building block complex potentials, some simple potential flows that we can superpose. We'll then use superposition of a source in a sink to generate a doublet, another building block flow. First, a quick summary of the equations. We're talking about steady, incompressible, irrotational Newtonian fluid flow, and we're neglecting gravity. We also approximate the flow as two-dimensional. We define the complex potential, W of z, as phi plus i psi, where phi and psi can be in either Cartesian or cylindrical coordinates. z itself is either x plus i y or r e to the i theta. These are the expressions for u, v, u, r, and u theta in terms of both phi and psi. Embedded within these are the Cauchy-Riemann conditions. We also define complex velocity, which is dw dz, again in either Cartesian or cylindrical coordinates. In our xy plane, which we also call the z plane, at some location z, the fluid has some velocity vector u of magnitude v and angle alpha from the horizontal. We can do a similar thing in cylindrical coordinates, where we define radius r and angle theta and our velocity vector of magnitude v has components u r and u theta. Now let's define some elementary planar irritational flows, or what I like to call building block flows. The simplest case is that of a uniform stream in the x direction. Streamlines are parallel horizontal lines, and the equipotential lines are vertical parallel lines. Here we start with the complex potential, which is u z, or written out with z equal x plus i y, from which we get phi and psi, and when we take the derivative of w, we get the complex velocity, u minus iv, from which u equal capital U, the magnitude of this velocity, and v equals zero. Or, you can start with the velocity field, since it's known in this problem, from which we know that dw dz, the complex velocity, becomes capital U minus zero, or just u. Now we can integrate w of z equal uz, plus a constant. This can be any constant, but we typically set it to zero, and we can always add a constant to our complex potential without changing the flow, since the velocity field is given by a derivative. This agrees with what we started with previously. In other words, we kind of worked backwards here. Now consider a uniform stream in an arbitrary direction. In other words, instead of pointing horizontal, the flow is up at some angle alpha. It turns out that w is uz e to the minus i alpha. We've basically rotated the entire flow field by angle alpha. Well, z is x plus i y, and e to the minus i alpha is expressed this way with cosine and sine alpha. If we expand this out, w of z is u times the quantity x cosine alpha plus i y cosine alpha minus i x sine alpha and then the two i's make a negative one, which cancels this negative sign, giving a plus y sine alpha. When we rearrange with all the real terms first, and then the imaginary parts, and recalling that w is by definition phi plus i psi, we see that this real term is phi, and this grouping of terms without the i is psi. You can see that this agrees with phi and psi as typed. Taking the derivative of w, we simply get u e to the negative i alpha, which can be expressed this way. Again, splitting into u and v components, we get u equal capital U cosine alpha and v equal capital U sine alpha, which agrees with our sketch here. Now consider a line source at the origin. Let's start with this complex potential, m over 2 pi natural log of z, where m is the source strength it turns out to be a volume flow rate per unit depth into the page, since this is a 2D problem. I note that many of these building block flows have three-dimensional counterparts. For example, here instead of a line source, we could have a point source. Recall the identity that natural log of AB is equal to the natural log of A plus the natural log of B. Thus, we can write this as m over 2 pi natural log of R plus natural log of e to the i theta. But the log of e to the i theta is, of course, i theta itself. So w is m over 2 pi natural log of r 
plus i m over 2 pi theta. Again, w is defined as phi plus i psi, so this is phi and this is psi. Again, these agree with what I have typed here. Taking the derivative of w, we get m over 2 pi z, since the derivative of natural log z is just 1 over z, and we can also write this in cylindrical coordinates, which are more useful here because we see that ur ends up being m over 2 pi r, and u theta is 0. In other words, the streamlines are rays coming out of the origin, and the equipotential lines are circles about the origin. The origin itself is a singularity point where the velocity is infinite, as you could see here when r equals 0. Again, this is a 2D line source. So imagine a line coming out of the page, and it's spewing out fluid from that line. And as the fluid moves along these rays, it slows down according to this 1 over r expression. There's no tangential flow anywhere. Notice also that everywhere streamlines and equipotential lines meet, they meet at right angles, which we called mutual orthogonality in a previous lesson m is positive for a source, and m is negative for a sink. A sink is simply a backwards source where the flow is going into the line, sucking fluid in. Our next building block is a line vortex at the origin. You may notice that these equations are very similar to those of the line source, except somewhat backwards or opposite. We had u theta equals 0, and u r was m over 2 pi r. Now we have u theta being gamma over 2 pi r, and u r being 0. Gamma here is the circulation around the line vortex. Taking any closed contour around the origin, the circulation would be gamma. Gamma is positive for a counterclockwise vortex, and negative for a clockwise vortex. The analysis of this line vortex is nearly identical to that of the line source, except what was real in the line source is now imaginary in the vortex, and what was imaginary in the source is now real in the vortex. So these flows are kind of opposite. Comparing them, for the line source, streamlines were rays, whereas for the line vortex, the equipotential lines are rays, as you see here, whereas for the line source, lines of constant phi are circles, whereas for the vortex, streamlines are circles. Flow moves in an irritational manner around the origin. Again, the origin is a singularity, since u theta is infinity when r equals 0. The strength of a line source is m, and the strength of a vortex is gamma. But if you compare these equations with those of the line source, you'll find that they're very similar, but opposite, as I said. These are our four basic building blocks. But we don't always want a source or a vortex at the origin. So let's look how we would describe a source or a line vortex at some arbitrary location. Namely, in our z plane, suppose we have a source at z1. So flow is coming from a line at z1 rather than at the origin. Our equations were for a source at the origin, but it turns out we can simply shift the axes to location z1. In other words, imagine a coordinate system with its origin at z1. To do this, we simply subtract z1 from z. This is how we shift the origin. Mathematically, consider the source at z1. We had w of z is m over 2 pi natural log of z for a source at the origin. So here, we write w of z is m over 2 pi natural log of z minus z1. That's our expression for a source of strength m at this location, z1. Similarly, for a vortex at z1, we would write w of z is negative i gamma over 2 pi times natural log of z minus z1. This is the equation for a vortex at z1, just as this is an equation for the source at z1. I'll define a fifth building block called a doublet. We'll use superposition to generate the doublet. Namely, we'll superpose a source at z equal negative epsilon along the real axis, and a sink at z equal epsilon also along the real axis. The source has strength m, and the sink has the same strength but opposite sign since it's a sink. 
let's sketch this in the z plane. We'll put our source at distance epsilon to the left of the origin and our sink at distance epsilon to the right of the origin. Fluid flows out of the source and gets sucked into the sink. We'll talk in more detail about superposition later, but recall that we can superpose flows because the equations are linear and homogeneous, namely both phi and psi satisfy the linear homogeneous Laplace equation. And superposition means we just add up the complex potentials. For the source, we have m over 2 pi, natural log, of z minus z at this point, which is negative epsilon, so we're subtracting minus epsilon, plus the sink, negative m over 2 pi, natural log of z minus z at this point, which is positive epsilon. So we just put epsilon there. This is the source, and this is the sink, and we simply add them together. Let's do some math. Recall, natural log of a minus natural log of b is natural log of a over b. Thus, we can write w of z is m over 2 pi, natural log of this portion, z plus epsilon, divided by this portion, which is z minus epsilon. Multiplying and dividing by z in both the numerator and denominator, we rewrite this as m over 2 pi, natural log, 1 plus epsilon over z, over 1 minus epsilon over z, and this is our complex potential for a source and sink of equal strength along the x-axis. To make a doublet, however, we imagine that epsilon shrinks to zero and strength m increases to infinity simultaneously. In other words, imagine the source and the sink coming together to the origin, but as they come together, m increases to infinity for both of them. You can look this up in math tables. For example, the CRC math table book that I've had for more than 40 years. Natural log of 1 plus psi over 1 minus psi can be expressed as an infinite series expansion as 2 times the quantity psi plus psi cubed over 3 plus psi to the fifth over 5, etc. Where here, we're letting psi equal epsilon over z from our expression. When we let epsilon go to zero, psi also goes to zero. And for very small psi, these terms are extremely small compared to the first term. So the natural log of 1 plus psi over 1 minus psi is approximately 2 psi, or here, 2 epsilon over z. So finally, w of z, which is the complex potential here for a doublet, is equal to m over 2 pi, and this whole logarithmic term reduces to 2 epsilon over z, where since the 2's cancel out, m epsilon over pi z. What most people do is let m epsilon over pi equal mu. So for a doublet, the complex potential is mu over z, where mu is the doublet strength. Recall that I said epsilon goes to zero and m goes to infinity, but we do this in such a way that m times epsilon is a constant. As epsilon decreases, m increases proportionally so that the product remains constant. Therefore, mu is a constant, which we call the doublet strength. This is the complex potential for a doublet along the x-axis. You can imagine rotating this to any other orientation, such as along the y-axis or anywhere else, and the equations would have to change appropriately. We'll treat this doublet as another building block flow, even though it itself was created by superposition of a source and a sink. Finally, let's sketch what the doublet looks like in the z-plane. The streamlines turn out to be circles tangent to the x-axis. Flow comes out of this singularity point at the origin to the left and circles around and gets sucked into the sink. Streamlines are always circles coming from the source and then diving into the sink. Exactly the same thing happens below the x-axis. In other words, this is a mirror image. What about the equipotential lines? Well, they have to be mutually orthogonal everywhere, except at the singularity, of course. It turns out that there are also circles, but they're tangent to the y-axis and look something like this, everywhere perpendicular to the streamlines where they intersect. And these are also mirror images, except about the y-axis. This is a doublet. 
This may remind you of an electric dipole or a magnetic dipole that you discussed in physics class. There is a huge black hole in the Reynolds cluster that behaves much like a magnetic dipole. Thank you, Captain Kirkhoff, for that far out fact. We make sure not to get too close to it. Uh, yes, I'm sure you do. You can imagine the three-dimensional version of this, where we superpose a point source and a point sink and get spheres instead of circles, as are equipotential lines and streamlines. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.